Today I'll be presenting on the work that my group and others have been doing on pulling together large collections of exome and genome sequencing data with the goal of building reference data sets that we can use for the interpretation of genetic variation. Um, and I'm going to focus here on the applications of these data sets primarily in the context of rare disease. Um, I will talk about a couple of different ways in which these resources can be used to understand the biology of genes in general and also uh, some complex disorders. Um, but the primary focus, particularly towards the end of the talk, will be on thinking about how we can leverage large-scale databases of variation to understand the variants that cause rare disease. And the, the fundamental intuition behind pretty much everything that we've done in the context of creating these reference data sets is on this slide here. That is that if we want to make sense of the variants that we find in an individual patient's genome or exome, we need to be able to interpret that variation in the context of tens of thousands or ideally hundreds of thousands of other genomes. And Ideally, what we'd want is to collect together uh, as many individuals from the general population as possible and have them all in one large collection. And then when we find a new variant in one of our patients, we, should, we would like to be able to look that up across all of these individuals and ask a few simple questions. Uh, firstly, has that particular genetic variant that's in the patient ever been seen before in the general population? If so, how common is it? And how common is it across different populations? And is it so common that, it, that that's not consistent with it actually being a true disease-causing variant? And then finally, if it has been seen before in an individual drawn from the general population, does that individual have a similar phenotype to my patient? Or what, does that, what does that individual's phenotype tell me about the probability of this being disease-causing? And so uh, these, these questions are uh, becoming more and more addressable as the scale of reference data sets continues to grow. Um, so we now know around the world, um, across a wide variety of different academic and industry collaborations, that at least 2 million exomes and uh, genomes have been sequenced. So the majority, of these, um, the majority of these individuals have been sequenced using exome sequencing, which is an approach to identify the variation that's found just in the protein coding bits of the genome. Um, but a non-trivial number and a growing number have also had their whole genome sequenced. So that is a, a, the sequence of all the three billion letters in, um, in, the, in their DNA. And the rate at which these data increase is very substantial. Everyone in this room has seen many plots showing the, uh, the drop in the costs of sequencing and the, the increase in the number of people who've been sequenced. Um, this is probably one of the plots that you've seen. This is a plot just from the Broad Institute showing the growth in the number of um, whole genomes sequenced on the left-hand side in blue and the growth in the number of exomes sequenced on the right-hand side in red. Um, this plot is out of date. It only shows us up to the end of 2016, so it doesn't include this year's numbers. Um, but the key things about these plots is firstly the numbers on the top here, which show us first that at the end of last year, the Broad had sequenced just under 70,000 human genomes and, and over a quarter of a million human exomes. Um, but the other, the second most important thing is the shape of this curve. So you can see here, particularly for genomes, in 2016, the Broad Institute sequenced more genomes than it had in all previous years combined. So we're now faced with an enormous amount of data that we can process to understand more about the patterns of variation across the human population. Um, so ideally, we'd want to be able to mesh, to merge all of these two million exomes and genomes together into one big reference database that we could look up uh, variation across. Uh, that proves to be very hard for many different reasons. Um, there's one mundane obstacle, which is that it's difficult to move large amounts of data from one place to another, although that's becoming easier as the Broad and other places move to cloud-based storage of large-scale genomic data sets. Um, but there's a much more challenging problem, which is the fact that these, the samples that have been sequenced as part of these projects were collected over many decades, and as a result, the consent and data use permissions that are available for these individuals is uh, extremely variable and was often collected at a time when things like broad genomic data sharing were not, had not yet been imagined. So that makes uh, many, many large-scale projects challenging. There are um, objections to data sharing. Of, of these 2 million exomes and genomes, a substantial number have been generated in industry settings, often by pharmaceutical companies like Regeneron or Amgen. Uh, those companies obviously regard that information as commercially valuable, so they're not interested in giving that away to academic uh, collaborators. Uh, you'll be shocked to learn that there are even some academics who are not fully on board with the idea of open and, and rapid data sharing. And so getting access to these data can be hard. And then finally, there's a, a, a technical challenge, which is that each of the different centers that generates large-scale sequencing data uh, often does so using its own slightly idiosyncratic pipeline, that is, pipeline for alignment and variant calling and other things. And so that means if you were to naively take the outputs of each of these different pipelines and merge them together into one big call set, what you would end up with is a big matrix where the variation was dominated by technical differences between centers or between pipelines rather than interesting biological difference between people. 
And so we and others have been working um, for a number of years to try to overcome these problems and build uh, very large reference data sets that are as harmonized as possible. That is, variation is called in exactly the same way across all of the individuals within them. And in this talk, what I wanted to do is first very briefly describe some of the public databases that exist out there that you may be interested in accessing when exploring your own data. Um, but I'll spend the bulk of this presentation talking about one of the databases that we built, the Nomad database, which is a successor to XAC. Um, I'll spend a fair bit of time uh, on ways in which, and how important it is to actually think about the read data that we provide in Nomad. So for individual variants, if you care about that variant, thinking about how to interpret the, the data that you find there. Um, we'll talk about uh, constraint and what that means. So that is constraint means uh, depletion of uh, functional variation in a particular region or gene. And then finally, I'll spend a fair bit of time, assuming we have time, uh, describing a method that we and collaborators have come up with for defining the right threshold to set uh, when you're looking for variation that may be consistent with a particular rare disease. And I'll explain how we go through that, uh, that whole process. So let me start though, then by introducing you to the current landscape of genomic reference databases. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but this, this plot shows the size and the ancestral diversity in colors. Um, of a number of these, uh, these existing databases. They range from uh, the relatively small and targeted, so GME, which is a, a, a data set of, uh, of just under 2,000 individuals of Middle Eastern descent, mostly from rare disease patients, um, through to the very large, and I'll obviously, I'll obviously spend most of my time talking about this Nomad data set larger, uh, this Nomad data set later. Now, there's, uh, these, I, I, I'm going to talk today, I guess, about um, a couple of data sets in detail, but I did want to mention the EXAC dataset, which was generated here at the Broad. Um, this was a dataset that was released back in October 2014. At the time, it was the largest reference dataset of human variation, and it contains information from about 60,000 human exomes, and that has, uh, that has been around now, I guess, for about three years, and is still widely used in a, in a clinical diagnostic setting as a, as a reference database. Um, I did also want to mention, because I think it's, uh, it's a recent and important addition to this list, is the Bravo dataset. This is a, an, another publicly accessible browser of uh, human variants. Uh, this contains information from about 65,000 whole human genomes, and it's by far the largest collection of whole genomes that currently exists. So that means if you're interested in variation that falls outside the protein coding regions, that is, variation that is not captured by the exome, then Bravo does a pretty good job of, of capturing that variation. It does have some limitations. Um, they can't, for instance, they don't provide uh, frequencies broken down by ancestry, so you just have basically one frequency across all of the samples in the in the Bravo dataset. Um, they don't allow you to download the dataset, so you can only access it uh, uh, variant by variant. And also, they have not removed related individuals from that dataset, so that provides some challenges for estimating allele frequencies. And then uh, the dataset I'm going to spend the most of my time talking about today is Nomad. Uh, Nomad is, is right now is the largest data set in terms of the number of individuals, um, but the majority of the samples in Nomad are exomes. We have uh, about 123,000 exomes that have gone into this collection of, of data and about 15,500 whole genomes. So we do have some information outside protein coding regions, but it's not as deep as what we would get from the Bravo data set, for instance. Now, this uh, data set, as I show on the left-hand side here, uh, contains information from many different populations, and I'll show a slide in a couple of slides' time that makes that a little bit clearer. Um, but it does contain information on populations that are not available in other uh, reference data sets, like Ashkenazi Jewish individuals, for instance. We have about 5,000 individuals, exomes, from individuals of Ashkenazi descent. Now, this is un also unusual in the sense that Nomad contains information from both exome and genome data, unlike any of the other resources. And the way we, that we've generated this data set is by uh, creating in, uh, separate call sets for our exome data and for our genome data, and then combining them together for downstream analysis. So that when you look at variants on the Nomad browser, you actually see these uh, two data sets combined. But it's important to emphasize that they're actually called separately. And that is, that is important when you come across, for instance, a variant that has a different frequency in the exomes versus the genomes, and that will come up fairly regularly. Um, we've, because of the uh, relatively uh, loose restrictions on data usage that we've been able to negotiate with the collaborators in this um, consortium, we can actually make the entire VCF available for download. And by the entire VCF here, I don't mean the individual level genotypes, but the list of all the variants that we've discovered in this collection and their frequency, the frequency of those variants across different populations. 
And, and also, I think unusually, we've been able to make this data set available with absolutely no restrictions on usage or publication. So if you're interested in accessing this data set and running an analysis across it, you don't need to ask permission from anyone. You don't need to add authors to a paper. You can basically just download the data set, use it, and then publish on it as you wish. So this, uh, the Nomad data set was released in October 2016, so it's about a year old now. Um, it was put together by a very large team here at the Broad, and I wanted to acknowledge um, many of the people who've been involved in this. I'll, I'll do so actually throughout the talk. The, the method that was used to generate this call set is a fairly standard, actually, version of the GATK pipeline that is run here at the Broad on basically any large-scale exome or genome call set that you might generate um, as part of your work here. So if you have sequencing that's done at the Broad and you get a variant call file or VCF file back from that sequencing data, that has basically gone through exactly the same pipeline as what we, as what we ran on Nomad. Um, now, the, the one thing, though, I did want to emphasize in, uh, in this slide in the middle here is just the sheer amount of data that we had to go through to create this call set. So we began in starting with the exome data on the left-hand side and the genome data on the right-hand side. We had a combined total of about three, uh, three petabytes of sequence data, so it's about 3,000 terabytes of data, uh, of raw read data that went into the pipeline to start with. And that then went through a whole series of steps that I'm not going to go through in detail today, um, but that re resulted in the production of about 40 terabytes worth of VCF files. So that is a, a, a big file where we have the, uh, the genotype of every individual, each of the roughly 138,000 individuals at every position in the genome. And we then process that entire matrix and collapse it down into the sites level VCF that we can release publicly. That is the, the, uh, the file containing each variant and its frequency. And so this, uh, this, again, as I mentioned, is a result of work from an enormous amount of people. I did want to acknowledge particularly the Broad Genomics Platform, which provided 90, generated 90% of the data that's gone into Exac and Nomad, as well as a lot of the resources required to generate this. Um, but also huge thanks to many people from the Data Sciences Platform who built the pipelines and the tools required to generate a data set on this scale. It's actually kind of staggering that we can put this amount of data through one pipeline and actually make it work at this scale. And also a huge thanks to the Hale team. Um, I think many of you will know about Hale. This is a, a, a scalable pipeline for analyzing large-scale genomic data sets. And this proved absolutely critical for analyzing um, all of the Nomad data. So in fact, pretty much all analyses that we run on Nomad-scale data sets now, we do using this uh, Hale pipeline. And massive thanks to all the individuals in, in my team who have also been involved um, in analyzing and uh, QCing this data set. So it's, it's worth um, emphasizing the people who actually end up in the Nomad data set. And I think it's easy, and in fact, we often see in um, publications uh, Nomad being described as a collection of healthy individuals. That's not necessarily true. In fact, these individuals come primarily from case control studies of complex adult onset disorders, things like type 2 diabetes, uh, early onset heart disease, um, and neuropsychiatric conditions like bipolar and schizophrenia are the, are the big players in this, but there's also a long tail of other conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, for instance. And so uh, for many of these individuals, we know that they were recruited as part of a case control study of one of those diseases. So we know whether they were a case or a control for that particular disease. Often we know very little else about the phenotype of those individuals. Now we have, as best we can, depleted uh, people who are known to have a severe pediatric disease, so this would include autism, pediatric cancer, any known Mendelian disease, as well as their first degree relatives. So the idea here was to create a reference data set that we could use as a comparison for severe rare disease patients, so that was important, but that doesn't mean we've managed to exclude everyone who has a rare disease from this data set. And so that means that there will be some people in here who do actually have a rare disease, or who will go on at some point to, to get a rare disease, an adult onset rare disorder, um, we can't exclude everyone in that data set because, again, we don't have detailed phenotype data on everyone. But what we can say is that I think in most situations, we think the frequencies of these individuals are probably broadly comparable to what we would get from a random sample from the general population. So it's unlikely that for a rare Mendelian disorder that you're interested in, that we have somehow enriched for patients who actually have that disease. Um, and usefully, and although I'm not going to talk about this uh, today at all, we do actually have some limited clinical data available. Well, it actually varies how much data we have available, but some clinical data available for something like two-fifths of the individuals in the data set. So that means if we find an individual with an interesting genotype in some cases, but by no means all, we can actually go back and learn a little bit more about the uh, clinical status of that individual and say whether or not they do actually have a particular disease, for instance. Now, this, uh, it's, 
Another point that I think is critical to emphasize is that XSAC and Nomad as resources do not do sequencing. We don't actually sequence samples ourselves. We rely entirely on the generosity of other consortia to provide the data that we then reprocess and perform variant calling over. And so the current uh, instantiation of the Nomad Consortium, the data set that I just described, uh, contains data that was, that was donated to us by 107 different principal investigators, uh, representing several dozen different uh, complex disease consortia. And I think it's worth acknowledging uh, the degree to which this, this demonstrates the commitment of the human genetics community to broad data sharing. Um, each of these individuals signed a memor memorandum of understanding that allowed their data to be put into this large aggregate resource, um, to be released as freely as possible to the broader community, and often with very little um, benefits to, the, to, these co to these consortia themselves. And I think that's testament to the fact that for many people who are now generating these data, in is making sure that their data gets used as widely and as, uh, as openly as possible, which is, which is fantastic. Now, this is one of the first plots that we generated when we had first made the Nomad call set. Again, this is across both the 123,000 exomes and the 15,500 genomes. Uh, this is a principal component analysis um, rendered in slightly hypnotic swelling 3D um, that gives you some information about the patterns of geographical ancestry across this, uh, co this collection of individuals. So uh, PCA, I suspect all of you know, but PCA is an approach that allows us to boil down the major axes of variation across a complex data set. When you run this on genomic, uh, genetic data, what it tells you basically is some information about the, uh, the ancestral location of the individuals who are in that particular data set. And what we can see here uh, in, this, in this PCA are, are sort of slightly diffuse clusters corresponding to major continental groups. In orange over here, we have our European clusters and these two little subgroups corresponding to individuals of Finnish ancestry. They cluster somewhat separately from the rest of Europe, um, as well as individuals of Ashkenazi descent. Uh, up here, we have a big South Asian cluster, uh, and there's also other clusters corresponding to individuals of African, and this is primarily African-American, that is West African ancestry, um, as well as East Asian and Latino, and, uh, or admixed um, American ancestry. Now, we, uh, to the extent that is possible, we did not rely on self-reported information from these individuals. So the ancestry, for instance, here is purely inferred from the, the genetics of these individuals. Um, in fact, for most of these individuals, we don't know what their self-reported ancestry is. But we can actually co relatively confidently assign them to these clusters using a random forest approach based on about 40,000 samples of known ancestry. And similarly, we infer uh, sex as well from the, genetic, from the underlying genetic data. So we know for sure that these individuals are chromosomally either male or female. And I'm not going to go through the details here, but we spent, before getting to the point of generating this plot, uh, the team spent a lot of time trying to figure out which samples to discard and which variants to discard. That is the very low quality uh, samples and variants. And in terms of sample QCs, we, so QC, we got rid of any uh, samples that appeared to have very low quality. Uh, any cases of sex chromosome abnormalities, because there it was hard to call variants on the X and the Y chromosome. And we also spent quite a bit of time removing first and second degree relatives. To the, to the extent that we can, from this data set, these individuals are unrelated and of relatively well-defined ancestry and sex. So if you were to go, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, that one could use in order to locate our own samples across, you know, against that plot? That's a, yeah, it's a really good question. I think we've gone back and forth on this um, the, there's, there's one thing we could do, for instance, which would be potentially to release the loading per SNP that would allow you to then uh, project your samples into the same PCA. And we're definitely very interested in doing that. The question, there's some interesting questions about re-identification of samples if we release the full data set. I think for releasing per SNP loadings, that, that's relatively safe. And what we, we will be attempting to do that, I think, over the next three to six months. The other cool thing that I think we can do with that PCA is you can imagine on each variant page actually having that PCA with uh, the individuals who carry that variant highlighted within that, within that map. So you can basically see exactly what the ancestral state is of the individuals who carry a particular variant. And so that, that's something we certainly can do. Again, we'll need to convince the IRB that that's safe to do so. So we'll, we'll work on that. Yeah? Over Nomad these days, or for general? Right. And I, I did have a slide in here about that, but I, I think I took it out. So there are now, you know, exactly as you say, there are now two data sets out there. There's XAC, which is our, you know, older 60,000 exome call set. There's Nomad, which contains twice the number of exomes and some genomes. Now, some XAC samples were dropped in the generation of Nomad. So there is some 
there are certainly some unique samples in XX that weren't represented in Nomad. Some, some of those were dropped because they're, they now, they no longer meet our quality thresholds. But some of them were dropped where, just for, for various reasons, we were no longer able to access that particular sample. So there is some non-redundant data in XX that can be useful. In general, we think Nomad is more conservatively filtered. Um, so that may be more or less useful depending on how you analyze it. In general, we still recommend that people look at both and then, and then interpret any given variant in the context of both of those data sets. But if you have to pick one, obviously pick Nomad. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I should have said at the very beginning, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me as people clearly are, which is great. Yes, go ahead. Were you going to speak how to interpret if there is a discrepancy between the two? I mean, is there really any way to know which one? So the, the key thing that we spend a lot of our time doing is looking at the read data in those situations. And I'll, I'll go a little bit through how we interpret read data, and that may be helpful. But there's no simple answer. I think the, the challenge is when you do get discrepancies in whether a variant is present in XX versus Nomad or whether it um, has a different frequency between the two, you ha you, we spend a lot of time looking at whether it's filtered in one versus the other and why that might be the case. We look at the read data across the two. Um, we, we, we can actually dig into the individual level data, which users can't, of course, and we look at whether the same individual was present in both, in both data sets, and it can be a mix. There's, there's all sorts of different causes that can possibly occur. Okay, so this is a uh, screenshot from a gene page. Uh, here we're looking at nomad.broadinstitute.org. Um, you can look up your favorite gene. I'm sure all of you have a favorite gene, and what you will find when you look it up, in this case, CFTR, the cystic fibrosis gene, is a plot of the coverage um, of our exome data in blue and our genome data in green across each of the exons of that particular gene. And then below that is a long list of all of the variants that were that are present within that gene, um, regardless of their functional annotation. And you can click on those variants to learn more about um, their frequency in different populations, their functional annotation, and how confident we are that they're actually real. So here is an example variant page. This is a famous variant, of course. This is the Delta, uh, Delta F508 variant, the most common disease-causing mutation in the CFTR gene, the most common cystic fibrosis-causing mutation. And uh, up here in the left hand, the top left-hand side of the variant page, we have the number of times that this variant has been observed in our exomes and our genomes. So you can see this is you know, one of the most common recessive variants that is known in the population, and it's present many times, so 1,700 times in our exome, uh, exome data set. So you can also uh, go over to this uh, table over here and look up the frequency of that variant across each of the different populations. So each continental population here is shown as an individual row, and you can look up the number of times that variant has been seen, the number of times it's been seen in the homozygous state, as well as its frequency. Uh, here's a zoom in of that particular plot. Um, and that this will be more or less helpful depending on uh, whether you know the ancestral state of your particular patient, for instance, or whether you're interested in uh, a variance distribution across uh, different geographies. And one point to emphasize here is this allele number column here, and that indicates the number of confident alleles at which we're confident that we can actually call a genotype. So that means here we have the number of times this variant has been called, here we have the number of times that we, the number of chromosomes that we have confidently assessed at this particular site, and so the allele frequency is basically this divided by this. And um, the second thing is down the bottom here, for most of the variants, I think for about 95 to 98% of the variants in Nomad, we actually also have available a snapshot of the raw read data supporting that particular variant. And for that, we have individuals with heterozygous, um, at a, with a heterozygous state for that variant, and five individuals who are homozygous for that particular variant. Um, so you can actually look at the evidence across that, and we, we, we select those individuals uh, who basically who have the highest genotype quality at that particular site. So it gives you some idea about how confident we are that that variant is actually real. So we recommend, in general, if you're interpreting a variant, that you actually look at this read data down here. Um, but it's worth spending a little bit of time digging into what you should actually be looking for. And we, we, we look at a lot of different things when we assess a particular variant. So we look, for instance, is it found in a poorly aligned region? I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But there are chunks of the genome, not many of them overlap the exome, but certainly in non-coding regions in particular, where they, uh, the region is highly repetitive and interpreting variation is challenging. There are multinucleotide variants, which I'll show in a second, and complex indels, which I'll also show. And of course, you also have to keep an eye out for the possibility of uh, low quality variants or somatic mosaicism, which can look actually quite similar. So here's an example of one variant we have to be very careful about interpreting. This is a case where there are, there is, there are two variants in the data set that turn out to be adjacent to each other and are actually clearly, in this case, found in the same individual. Now, in that particular case, if there are two variants that are found adjacent to each other or they're found within the same codon, um, our ex the existing annotation pipelines run by us and, in fact, any other group, almost any other group around the world, interpret each variant independently. 
So they do not take into account the fact that two variants present in the same codon can result in a different, a different impact on the functional outcome of, of that particular combination of variants. So in, the, in this particular case, we have two variants adjacent to each other. One of them is predicted to be a missense mutation. One of them is predicted to be a nonsense mutation. But in fact, you can see very clearly in this data set that both of them are found on the same reads. That is, they are actually uh, as present as a single event. And the combined effect of those two variants is a, is a serine to glutamine missense mutation. So these are actually flagged in EXAC. If you look up a variant um, in EXAC that is tagged as a nonsense variant, but it has one of these uh, adjacent variants next to it, it will come up as being flagged in that data set. We're working on doing the same thing across NOMAD now. Uh, this is another kind of slightly related condition. This is situations where you have two uh, insertions or deletions that are close by to each other, and again, are found on the same haplotype in a particular individual. So here we have a little deletion and a, a single base pair deletion, and here we have a single base pair insertion, an insertion of an A. Um, so each of these individually would, would be predicted to be frame shift mutations, but actually because you have in the same uh, event a deletion and an insertion that are the same size, the overall impact is uh, no effect whatsoever. There is no frame shift uh, event in this particular region. And so again, this is something you would want to be very careful about if you were looking, if you had found a apparently a common frame shift in your gene, you would want to make sure that that common frame shift was not found adjacent to another event that restored, uh, restored its frame. And then another uh, slightly more complicated uh, class of variant to interpret is uh, somatic mosaic variants. And here is an example where we have a, a variant that it has a quite skewed allele balance. And so you can, you can see that it's present on only a relatively small fraction of the reads here. And if you look at this histogram up here, you can see this histogram actually shows you the relative proportion of the reads that fall into one allele versus the other. And you can see actually that this histogram shows a very small number of red reads compared to blue reads, very far away from the 50% ratio that we would expect to see for a heterozygous variant. And this suggests either that this is an error, um, this, could, this could just be a low quality site, um, or potentially that this is actually a somatic mosaic variant that is just not present at 50% uh, frequency within that, that particular individual. Uh, and you can actually click on the variants to get more information about the relative uh, abundance of the two reads. So you can see here this, this uh, variant has 21% of the reads supporting a T and 78% of the reads supporting a C. Um, so, so that gives you some idea about how we can interpret individual variants within EXAC. Now, um, I'm going to spend the rest of this talk basically going through ways in which we can use the data set as a whole to interpret variation that we find potentially in rare disease patients. And one of the things that's useful with a large data set like EXAC or NOMAD is that we can look not just at the region, at the variants that are present in the data set, but also the variants that are missing from the data set and identify regions that are actually significantly depleted for variation above expectations. Um, this is a concept that we call call constraint or functional depletion. So what we have done, and this is work that was led by Caitlin Smoha, a graduate student in Mark Daly's lab, who's been working with our lab for this work. Um, what Caitlin did is to develop a statistical model that allowed her to predict uh, with considerable certainty, uh, given the known mutation rates across a gene or region of the genome, how many variants of a given functional class we should expect to see in that gene or region in 60,000 people, and we can then compare that expectation against our actual observation to figure out whether we actually see fewer variants of that class in that region compared to what we should by chance. And so to, to just to demonstrate how that works, here, here is a genome-wide look at synonymous variants. So these are variants that are found in protein coding regions but don't change the amino acid sequence. You can see here uh, for each gene, the number of variants we would expect to see under Caitlin's model, and then the number of variants we actually observe in 60,000 people. This is in our exact data set, and you can see the fit is extremely good. So Caitlin's model is very well calibrated for variants that do not change the function of the protein, or at least mostly don't, like synonymous variants. Caitlin's model is extremely well calibrated for predicting the number of such variants we should expect to see per gene. But as we move to other uh, much more functionally damaging classes of variation, so this is an extreme example. These are predicted protein truncating or loss of function variants. That fit becomes much less good. And that is true because for most genes in the genome, there is a significant depletion of loss of function variation compared to expectations. And that should not be a surprise to anyone here. Basically, what that tells us is that for most genes in the genome, loss of function variants are bad. They do something deleterious. And as a result, they tend to get removed from the population by natural selection. So the fact that most genes fall below this line is not a surprise. What's cool, though, is once you have 60,000 people or 138,000 people, you can start to calculate exactly how far below the line each gene falls. And that gives you a measure of exactly how deleterious loss of function variants are within that gene. And so uh, just to, to give you an example here, this is a gene where we know exactly what happens when you break it. Uh, this gene, DINK1H1, we know that uh, de novo heterozygous 
loss of function and missense variants are associated with a range of pretty profound neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, intellectual disability, uh, some seizure disorders, and others. In this particular gene, we see Caitlin's model gives us a well-calibrated estimate of the number of synonymous variants we should expect to see, but we are missing two-thirds of the missense variants that we would expect in the, in the exact population, and almost all the loss of function variants are gone here. We would expect to see 161. In fact, we only observe four. Two of those are artifacts. One of them is a sequencing error. One of them is an annotation error. The other two we don't know. In fact, those may be individuals who actually have, uh, who actually have uh, severe disease. We don't know. Um, but e either way, what we can tell from this data set is that even though we, or we know the phenotype is associated here, but even if we didn't, we could certainly have some confidence that loss of function variants have some impact on uh, disease risk. And so here is one example where we didn't, until very recently, know what the function of this gene was, the phenotypic impact of this gene was. Uh, this is a gene called UBR5. We know it's involved in the ubiquitin pathway. Uh, we know it, uh, if you knock it out in mice, it kills them during embryogenesis. Um, there is not a reported human LOF phenotype, although I was just told last week by, uh, by Heather Method that, in fact, this gene has just come up in their scans uh, of looking for uh, de novo LOF variants in epilepsy. So this appears to be an epilepsy gene. And again, we see a very similar pattern to what we see in DINCON H1. Well-calibrated model, uh, loss of almost half the, the missense variants, and virtually all of the loss of function variants are missing from this gene. Yeah? Is there a ready way to identify those? And in fact, we're working on that um, for the nomad constraint levels. So for sequencing errors, that's harder. Obviously, often that requires just manually looking at the reads. We are applying more stringent uh, filtering in general for variants that are going into the nomad data set than in XAC, so that will clean up some of those errors. The annotation errors can be picked up by a tool called Lofty, which is our, uh, an automated method that we use for identifying predicted loss of function variants that probably don't actually cause LOF. So it flags, for instance, things like variants that are found very close to the end of the coding sequence, or variants that are found in non-canonical transcripts and other, other approaches like that. Um, and that, that is also being built into the Nomad constraint call set, and I think that, that will also substantially improve our calls there. So across EXAC, we identify over 3,000 genes with a near-complete depletion of loss of function variants. And that uh, set of 3,000 genes includes almost all known haploinsufficient disease genes, that is, genes where knocking out one copy is sufficient to cause disease. Um, but importantly, more than 70% of these highly LOF-depleted genes have unknown function. Uh, that is, we do not yet have a human phenotype associated with that particular gene, and in most cases, we actually don't even have a guess as to what the function of those genes are. So this gene set has now become a, uh, a set, of course, of very high interest, and it's already uh, been shown by Mark Daly, Ben Neal, and others to be enriched for genes that are associated with de novo loss of function variants in autism and schizophrenia. And by Andrea Garner from Ben's group, uh, these genes are also being shown to be enriched for loss of function variants associated with a whole range of different phenotype, phenotypic conditions, um, including, for instance, high, high risk of ADHD and others. So it's important to spend a bit of time discussing how to interpret the, this loss of function constraint or what we call the PLI score. And this is something you can find for, every, for almost all genes on the exact gene page. You can find this score. It gives you some, it, it ranges between zero and one, where zero means we are pretty confident something is not LOF depleted. One means we are very confident that it is LOF depleted. And it's important to know what that means biologically. So it's tempting, I think, in some cases to assume that very high PLI means that that gene must be, that loss of function variants in that gene must be very, have very severe effects. But there's not a simple correlation between those two things. And in fact, um, we, know that, uh, we know that high PLI probably means that heterozygous loss of function in that gene confers at least a 5% selective disadvantage. But basically, any, any variant that confers somewhere between a 5 and 100% selective disadvantage, um, that will be sufficient to push a gene into that high PLI category. So that means that it's very likely this gene has some kind of haploinsufficient mechanism, but the clinical impact of loss of function in that variants in that gene could be very broad. That could range from complete embryonic lethality, that is, you never find an individual who actually has a real LOF variant in that gene, because otherwise they'd be dead. At the other end of the spectrum, you could have a, a, a uh, a particular gene where heterozygous LOF variants cause a substantially increased risk of schizophrenia, which again, you know, could confer a, a reduced reproductive success. So PLI scores do not provide resolution within these categories. You have to be kind of careful about interpreting them. It means that it is very likely that there is a disease associated with heterozygous LOF in that gene, but the severity of that disease is unclear. So there's lots of work that we have ahead of us, and some of which I've already mentioned, to improve these constraint estimates. This work is now being led by Conrad Kaczewski from my group. Um, Conrad has done a number of things on the NOMAD, the new NOMAD data set to improve constraint, um, and this new constraint metrics will actually be released at some point over the next, uh, the next few weeks. 
So he has built in methylation data into our mutation model for CPG sites, and that actually turns out to substantially improve our prediction of mutation rates within CPGs. Um, we, he does base level rather than exon level coverage modeling, uh, better filtering of LOF variants using Lofty, as I mentioned earlier, and overall, uh, this results in a, uh, an increase in the sensitivity of this metric. So this, this combined with a larger size of Nomad increases our ability to identify constrained genes, um, including now 13% uh, more of the known haploinsufficient genes now fall into this high PLI category. So we're now capturing virtually all of the genes that are known to be haploinsufficient within that set. Um, and this, uh, this allows us to consider putting genes along a spectrum of loss of function intolerance, ranging from highly LOF intolerant genes over here, where again we might consider genes that, uh, that cause embryonic lethality or others might be over this side, and genes over this side might be genes where homozygous LOF is actually well tolerated. And we can start to consider putting genes along this particular spectrum, although admittedly with a pretty weak resolution in some parts of the spectrum. So here, for instance, is the distribution of the observed over expected ratio for known haploinsufficient disease genes. You can see it's very heavily left skewed. Uh, here is the distribution for genes that are known to have a dominant effect but not necessarily be haploinsufficient. These are recessive disease genes which have about a 40% reduction in loss of function variance, but by no means a complete reduction in loss of function variance because selection is, is actually quite weak for loss of function variance in recessive genes. And then here is a set where we know that loss of function variants have very weak effects. These are olfactory receptors, where in many cases you can actually knock them out without causing um, very severe selective effects. And so we're still working on it uh, and coming up with better defined metrics for putting genes along this particular spectrum. But I think we're now converging on a set of metrics using these large reference data sets that will allow us to say for a particular gene uh, how, where that particular gene is likely to fall in terms of its probability of actually having a disease phenotype if you have a heterozygous or homozygous LOF within it. And one other thing that I thought is, is, is worth mentioning briefly, and this is work that's actually been published by Caitlin, uh, it's up on BioArchive, is that we can apply this uh, approach not just to entire genes, but also to regions of genes. Um, so to define particular chunks of a gene where there is a depletion of missense variation compared to expectations. Uh, here is one example. This is CDKL5, where we know that missense, de novo missense mutations cause severe seizure syndromes. Um, all, almost all of the known disease-causing missense mutations in this gene fall in this N-terminal uh, domain up here. And in fact, that turns out to be exactly the region that is constrained in EXAC uh, for missense mutations. So the rest of the, rest of the gene actually has a, uh, an, a number of missense mutations that is completely consistent with neutrality. Um, but this region up here has, has a very strong depletion of missense mutations. And so that's, that means that even if we didn't yet have these mutations that we've seen in patients, we would predict that if you wanted to find patients with CDKL5 mutations, you should be looking exactly here. Um, and that proves to be generally true. So if you look across all of the uh, a, a set of severe haploinsufficient disease genes and take the, um, the missense mutations in ClinVar, 89% of those ClinVar pathogenic missense mutations fall within the 14% most constrained sequence across those genes. So this proves to be a pretty effective way of actually zooming in on regions of genes that are most likely to be important when looking at missense mutations. And Caitlin has actually defined a set of metrics that you can use to, uh, to an annotate and interpret uh, pathogenic variants in that context. So the last thing I wanted to talk about today is ways in which we can think about taking a variant that has been found in a rare disease patient in one of your studies or someone else's studies and use Exac and Nomad to consider um, whether or not that variant has a frequency that is consistent with actually being disease causing. And the intuition here is basically going back to the very first slide I showed, which is that there is, if you look a variant up in the general population, uh, there is some frequency where if that variant is found above that frequency, there is, it is, there is simply that it is conceivably true that that is a genuine disease-causing variant. Um, now, of course, there's some caveats, which I'll get into in a minute, but, but the population frequency actually proves to be one of the most powerful uh, filters that we have for removing, um, for filtering down to a set of variants that are potentially pathogenic within a patient. And just to illustrate how useful that is, how useful scale is in, in improving this benefit, um, here we're comparing the number of variants remaining in a patient's exome. Uh, if that patient is drawn here from one of five different uh, continental populations, East Asia down to Europe, um, depending on which reference data set you use. And here we're slightly unfairly compar comparing the relatively old NHLBI ESP data set, which contains six and a half thousand individuals of European and African American ancestry, with the EXACT data set, which, can, which was about 10 times as large and had much more diverse ancestry. And what we can see here is that there's about a, somewhere between a five and tenfold reduction 
in the number of variants remaining in a patient's exome after filtering with a 0.1% frequency threshold. Uh, and that is true, that is much more true for, uh, for populations that are not well represented in ESP, like East Asians, for instance. We do equally well with EXAC um, in East Asia as we do in Europe, um, whereas that's not true for, for previous data sets. And the reason that EXAC is so much better than previous data sets is both because it's much larger, but also critically because it has many more populations. And so you can imagine each population basically provides another opportunity to take a random draw from that particular variant, and if it is actually neutral, for it to drift up to a higher frequency within the population, therefore allowing us to exclude it as being an actual pathogenic variant. Now, um, for, a, for a given disease model, uh, for, actually for any variant in the genome, the number of candidate variants that you have to explore in a patient's exome declines following this curve here, and here, this is plotted here for each of the different populations, um, depending on where we set our frequency threshold. So if you wanted to get rid of lots and lots of variants in a patient's, uh, in a patient's exome, you could set the frequency threshold extremely low, and that would exclude you know, most of the potential candidate pathogenic variants. Um, but if you wanted to make sure you captured, for instance, a recessive disease variant, you may need to set the, uh, the frequency threshold much higher, and that would leave you with many variants you would have to sift through to try and look for uh, candidate causal variants. So the question is, for any given disease model, where we should actually draw that cutoff? So where we should actually put that line to say any variant that falls below that line are the only variants that I'm going to look at in this particular analysis. And so in other words, how common is too common for a variant to be pathogenic? And this varies depending on a whole bunch of different things, and we've tried, we basically tried to wrap this up together into a, into a single model. So the, the fundamental assumption underlying all of our analyses here is basically that certainly for dominant conditions and in a more complex way for recessive conditions, the frequency of a pathogenic variant in a reference sample, that is Exarch or Nomad, Critically, so long as that sample is not selected on the basis of that condition, or selected on the basis of a condition that is associated with your disease, should not exceed the prevalence of the condition in the general population. And so that means that if a condition, for instance, has a prevalence of one in 10,000, then if your variant is dominant, the allele frequency of it cannot be greater than that particular frequency, otherwise your frequency would be more common in the population. So that's, I think, pretty self-explanatory. Now, of course, that's not necessarily always true, and you have to uh, take into account the fact that there are some populations where recessive mutations can drift to spectacularly high frequencies despite being disease-causing. So particularly recessive mutations in founder populations or bottlenecked populations. There are issues around incomplete penetrance that we can build in in a slightly hand-wavy way into our model, but you have to bear that into account when in interpreting variants. And in a very, very small handful of cases, there may be things like balancing selection where, for instance, like sickle cell anemia, the frequency of the disease-causing mutation is quite high in the population, higher than you might expect to see by chance because there is a heterozygote advantage associated with that particular mutation. So there are a, a set of broad parameters that we could consider in interpreting where we draw our line at the maximum population allele frequency that is consistent with a variant being disease-causing. And so these tend to be, uh, we can basically pull these into three broad groups. That is, we can take the prevalence of a particular disease, um, calculate it as best we can. The epidemiology here is often a little bit shaky. We can take the genetic heterogeneity, and I'll explain how we define that in a second. But that is basically the, uh, it's, it's a measure of how, uh, how the uh, genetic architecture of that disease is spread across variation. Um, so basically, how many different variants are likely to contribute to that particular disease? And then the other third term is penetrance. That is the probability that an individual who carries a pathogenic genotype will actually go on to get that disease. So let's, uh, set, let's take an example here of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, here we have a prevalence of about 1 in 5,000. Uh, because it's a dominant condition, we multiply that by half, and that will, that will get factored into this calculation in a second. Um, the penetrance, we can set, again, with some hand waviness, the penetrance of different variants within HCM varies very substantially. We can set some threshold at, say, 50%. You can play around with this threshold and change it depending on exactly how, uh, how permissive you want to be in finding variants that may contribute to a disease. And then to estimate heterogeneity, what we take is the most common uh, allele that has been established as being pathogenic for that particular disease. So in this particular case, there's an MYBPC3 variant, which causes 2.2% of all European HCM cases. So that is, that is by far the most common HCM-causing allele in European populations. And we can be pretty confident that there is not another pathogenic allele out there that is more common than that. If there was, we would certainly have found it by now, given how many patients we've sequenced with HCM. So we, we add 3%, we conservatively add 3%, which is the upper bound of the estimate of the, um, the frequency of that allele in European populations. And so we can then uh, multiply, we can basically then multiply these pieces together to get a maximum credible, credible population allele frequency of 6 times 10 to the minus 5. So that means that any variant that exceeds that threshold 
is very unlikely to actually be a dominant cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we have a, for those of you who are interested in calculating this or playing around with a whole bunch of different parameters and seeing how they change that threshold, uh, our collaborator James Ware has built an app at cardiodb.org. Uh, this is, despite the name, is actually applicable to any disease, not just cardiac disease. And you can basically pr uh, pop, pop in each of those different parameters and play around with that to see exactly what gets spat out in terms of the maximum credible population allele frequency for your set of, uh, for your set of uh, parameters. And importantly, I think, and surprisingly for most people, for dominant diseases, this number typically ends up much, much lower than people think. So we will often, for instance, in our in, uh, in a traditional approaches to set a population threshold of something like 0.1%, for instance, for dominant diseases. And in fact, for most dominant diseases, you can very confidently set that threshold much lower. If you observe a variant three or even five, you know, three or even two times in some cases in Nomad, we can probably confidently exclude that as actually being a disease-causing variant. So the second question then is, what is the variant that you should look up in Exaqua Nomad as being the comparator here? And this is something we call the filtering allele frequency. And this is actually not as simple as simply looking at the frequency of that variant within the population. So we, uh, we calculate this. I'm not going to go through the particular statistical adjustment we do here, but we basically end up calculating a, an estimate which is sort of the, which is basically the upper bound of the possible frequency of that, uh, of that variant within that population, given how many times it has been observed. So this, this provides us with a conservative estimate of the allele frequency of that variant within the exac or nomad populations. And importantly, we, we apply this across each of the different um, outbred populations within the exac or nomad data sets, and then we take the highest of those across those different populations. So if there is a variant that is very rare across a number of different populations, but very common in East Asia, we will take that higher allele frequency as our threshold. So that will, be, that will be the one that we use in determining whether or not that variant is actually pathogenic or not. And the, the logic here is basically if a variant is too common in any one population, then it, it, it's likely too common to actually cause disease. There's some assumptions made here about the fact that the penetrance of a variant doesn't differ across populations, and you, of course, may want to adjust those in your own analyses. Okay, so we can now calculate the maximum credible population allele frequency, and then we can, we can compare that against the filtering allele frequency for any particular variant that we identify as a candidate within our, our patient and compare those two. If the filtering allele frequency, that is the frequency of that particular candidate variant in a patient, is higher than the maximum credible population allele frequency, then uh, we can say that that variant is too common to be pathogenic and rule it out from being considered in our downstream analyses. And if, if in fact the opposite is true, if this variant is, is, uh, has a lower frequency than the credible AF, then we can retain that variant and it may be pathogenic. Of course, this doesn't tell us that it is pathogenic. It just tells us, that, tells us that it falls within a frequency range which is consistent with that actually being a disease-causing mutation. Um, so again, just working through an example here, here is a variant which is of, in M, again, in MYBPC3, which is of uncertain significance across multiple submitters in ClinVar. It has a two-star rating in ClinVar, so multiple submitters with no conflicts. Um, but, it, but it is across the board is, is regarded as a VUS. Um, so we can look that variant up in EXAC, and we have a, a this is its distribution across multiple different populations. Uh, we can cross out two of those because there uh, there's insufficient numbers of individuals in those two populations to get uh, to get accurate estimates, and then take the most common uh, the the population in which this variant is the most common, which is the non-Finnish Europeans, and then calculate our filtering AF that's provided in the EXAC homepage. So you can look that up. Uh, you can look that up here and actually download that across all the variants in the data set. And that proves to be, uh, for this particular variant, the, um, the, the filtering allele frequency is 6 times 10 to the minus 4. So let's now compare that against, so we have calculated the credi maximum credible allele frequency for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We now have a variant, uh, we now have the filtering allele frequency for our candidate variant, and that in fact is substantially higher. 6 times 10 to the minus 4 is substantially higher than 6 times 10 to the minus 5. So it's 10, this is 10 times too common to be a plausible cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So again, unless this variant has an extraordinarily low penetrance, and we can actually calculate that, that proves to be, that must be extremely low for this to be pathogenic, we can actually confidently exclude this variant as a cause of HCM. So it's probably shown up in the databases purely because it's observed in MYBPC3, and is, it, is, it is indeed a relatively rare variant, but just not plausibly rare enough to actually be a cause of HCM. So that, uh, that I think tells us, uh, gives us information that we can then deploy across a whole range of different settings. And what I will say is that um, we are working on methods to make these, both these calculations easier and also to actually build them into the XAC and Nomad browser so that it's, it's uh, relatively straightforward for people to run this analysis across uh, an entire VCF of their rare disease patient, um, compare the, the variants they find in their patient against the credible uh, allele frequencies that we observe for their particular disease um, in the XAC and Nomad dataset.
So now in terms of what's coming next for Exaco Nomad, um, before I open up to questions, um, there's a lot of work still ahead uh, for us, particularly on the Nomad data set. We are working now on a, a, a wide analysis of protein truncating variants across all of the genes in the Nomad data set with the goal of being able to place as many genes as possible along that spectrum that I showed you, basically as accurately as possible, say, whether this gene is associated with a profound loss of function phenotype if there's a heterozygous inactivation, right the way through to this being a gene which is clearly very tolerant of LOF variants being present. Uh, Laurent Francioli in my group is working on detecting constraint in non-coding regions using the, uh, the whole genome data, and that will become much more useful, I think, as we start expanding to much larger numbers of genomes uh, over the next year or so. Mike Tarkowski's group, uh, Ryan Collins from Mike Tarkowski's group, is leading an effort to call structural variants across, exact, uh, across the NOMAD uh, whole genomes. So that will actually provide us for the first time a, a well-calibrated reference data set of uh, insertions, deletions, and some other more complex structural variation, um, which is critical, of course, for those of us who are now sequencing genomes from rare disease patients and finding these strange variants, um, but often without being able to figure out how common those are in the general population. There's, there's a number of new call sets coming down the pipeline. We hope later this year to be able to produce a, uh, a next, our next whole genome call set. This will be our first call set on the new uh, Build38 reference genome, and it will hopefully span a somewhere over 65,000 uh, whole human genomes. So that will provide the deepest view yet of variation within the non-coding regions of the genome. And then sometime in 2018, we hope to be able to put together our next exome call set, again on Build38, and this time exceeding uh, 250,000 human exomes. So the goal there will really be able to, uh, with that data set, we'll really be able to identify uh, the vast majority of genes in which there is a, a statistically significant depletion of loss of function variation, for instance. And that will also massively increase our ability to look for missense constrained regions of particular genes. And then a final piece that I, I'm not going to talk about at all today, but which we're very excited about, is uh, starting to work on the possibility of doing genotype-guided recontact within NOMAD. So that means that in individuals for whom we find a particularly interesting variant, so say someone who is homozygous for a loss of function variant in an interesting gene, or who carries a variant that has previously been reported to be disease causing, we're actually now forming a recontact subconsortium within NOMAD that will allow us to actually go back and get phenotype data for individuals with those specific genotypes. This is very much a work in progress. It is both technically and regulatorily complex, um, but we hope that we'll be able to make progress on that over the next six months or so. Uh, so with that, I'll finish by thanking everyone who's been involved in putting these resources together. A huge thanks to the EXAC and NOMAD analysis teams who've been involved in both shaping the resource, but also de uh, defining the, the QC and the analysis, the downstream analysis pipelines. Um, I've, already, I've already cited, but we'll cite again here, um, the groups here in the data sciences platform who were responsible for building the re pipelines required to generate these resources, but also just actually calling these variants on such a massive scale. We, just, we couldn't do this without their support. Uh, ben, Conrad, and Matt have been involved in building the Nomad uh, website. Jessica Alfoldi has led an enormous amount, done an enormous amount of work in the regulatory uh, permissions behind collecting all of these, these samples. Thanks again to the Hale team and also to the 107 PIs in the Nomad Consortium uh, for donating the data that's been required to build this big resource.